Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we're in our series called The Glory of the One and Only, and of course that's Jesus. And we're looking at stories from his life that show us his glory or teach us something about his glory. And this morning we're going to focus in on a time when he was teaching and he said something very famous. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that's himself, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's the most famous Bible verse of all time, right? People put it on signs and they hold up at football games. People put it on t-shirts. People put it on Taylor Swift. Okay, no they don't. Taylor Swift's probably never been associated with this Bible verse ever, which is unfortunate, but you get the idea, right? It's, a, it's just a super famous Bible verse. And so I think it's very interesting that it has its source in one of the most obscure stories of the Old Testament. And for that, we have to go back 1,500 years before Jesus to the book of Numbers, chapter 21. So if you brought your personal Bible from home today, I invite you to get it out and open it up to Numbers, chapter 21. It's right at the beginning, fourth book of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 21. If you have a smartphone with a Bible app, punch up Numbers 21. If you're at home, watch on the live stream. Awesome. So glad you're with us this morning. But you got no excuse, right? Grab your personal Bible, open up to Numbers chapter 21. And before we read it, there's two things. The first thing is be prepared. The reason this story is so obscure is that it's confusing. And let's face it, it's downright weird. And the, the second thing is that you have to know is that this story is about a group of people who are complainers, right? Have you ever known someone who's a complainer? I think that all, almost all of us have someone in our, in our lives who is just a complainer. They just complain about everything all the time. You can't make these people happy no matter what you do. They're just going to complain, right? And in this story, we have this big group of people, and they're all complainers. They're the people of, of, the, of God in the Old Testament. They're, they've, they've just been delivered from slavery in Egypt by God. Moses had led them out of Egypt. He's leading them across the wilderness, and they're camping out in the desert on the way to the promised land. And yet all they can do is complain. First thing they do is complain there's no water. And so God causes a spring to rise up out of a rock. And then they start complaining that there's no food. And so God sends them manna. And this, this manna was, I mean, just talk about grace. It was bread that formed on the desert floor each morning out of the dew that settled on the desert floor. And, and they could just go out and, and, and pick it up and eat it. And it was completely out of God's grace, right? There was no sowing, there was no fertilizing, no watering, no waiting, no harvesting, no baking, nothing. They just bred, they picked it up. And when it first started to appear, the people said that it was the best thing they had ever tasted. Ever tasted. That's a strong statement. And so, I don't know, it, it, the Bible calls it bread, I'm thinking it was maybe something more akin to like s'mores, right? I mean, after all, they were camping, right? But anyways, so a, a totally gracious gift of God. But then they start complaining that there's no meat. So God sends quail and they have meat to eat. And now they're still complaining. We're going to pick it up in Numbers chapter 21, starting at verse 4. It says, they traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. So we see that is, as often is the case with complainers, right? It, they're contradictory. Wait, if there's no food then how can you detest this miserable food, right? So which is it? And hey, if slavery, if Egypt is so great, why don't you go back? It's a short walk, right? Moses is not making these people follow him. Uh, no one's making them. They can go back to Egypt anytime they want. And since the food that they are now complaining about as being miserable is this manna, 
which they had previously hailed as being the best thing they'd ever tasted and which was provided by God for free every day, this complaint is a direct assault on God's grace. Think about it. He's providing this manna completely for free, no effort required, totally out of his grace, and they are rejecting his grace. They are, um, that, that, this is no small matter. I would not advise rejecting God's grace. Look what happens. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The complainers find themselves dying. Instead of being kept alive by this manna, this grace of God, they reject the grace and they end up dying. See, complaining is habit-forming, isn't it? And it's not the first instance. They've been complaining chapter after chapter after chapter. But what makes this story a little bit unique Okay, a lot of unique, right? We're going to look at all kinds of ways that this story is unique. But one of the ways that this story is unique is that it's the first time in all these complaining stories, the first time they ask for forgiveness. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord would take the snakes away from us. They ask for forgiveness, and then they, they, they ask that the snakes would be taken away. This is significant. Remember that. They ask that the snakes be taken away. We'll come back to that. First time in all these complaining stories, they ask for forgiveness. That's significant. So May, Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake, and he put it on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. That's it. End of story. No explanation. Just bizarre, right? I mean, it doesn't seem like the way God would work. It's not the way God works in the Bible, it's, there's no other place before it or after it where God works this way. God doesn't seem to work this way in our lives today. What, what's going on here? This is, this, is a, this is a bizarre story. But this story has inspired this. It's called the Staff of Asclepius. The Staff of Asclepius. And you've probably seen it before. This serpent wound around a pole. Maybe you've seen it on the back of an ambulance or the logo of the World Health Organization, or the Yale School of Medicine, or your doctor's leg, or Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I got a little fun. But the, the, the staff of Asclepius, it's called the staff of Asclepius because the first time in recorded history that we've seen this image was in the Temple of Asclepius. These are the ruins of the Temple of Asclepius in Greece. You can go there today. This is what they look like. We can kind of imagine what this temple looked like 1,300 years ago when it was built. And on this temple was this image of the staff of Asclepius, a, a snake wound around a pole. That was about 1,300 B.C., and it was, it was about two to 300 years after Moses and the story of God telling Moses to take a, make a bronze snake, wind it around a pole, and set it up for healing. And the, the thing about this, this, uh, this temple of Asclepius is it was a temple of healing. It's where the doctors in ancient Greece worked. It's where people would come for healing. So it stands to reason that the Greeks had heard about this story from Moses hundreds of years earlier and use this symbol of the snake wrapped around a pole as their, their symbol for their temple. See, every time from now on that you ever see this symbol of a, of a serpent wrapped around a pole on an ambulance or whatever, you're going to remember this bizarre, obscure story from the Old Testament. A very few, there, there's, there's all kinds of things about this story that we've got we to gotta, we gotta dig a little bit deeper. 
uh, uh, things that make this, this story very unique. Uh, first of all, forgiveness is central to this story in a very unique way, right? Because it's the first time that these complainers start asking for forgiveness. And then number two is this, it, this very interesting story. Do you notice, remember that the people prayed that God would take the snakes away, but God didn't take the snakes away. Instead, he provided healing. And I think this is very significant. He, he provides a way to endure as long as the plague lasts. He provides hope and healing. God is not a vending machine. And of course, this is exactly the way we see God work in our, in our lives today. God is not a vending machine. We, we pray that, that he would uh, fix things in our lives and take things away. And, and, and of course, sometimes that happens. But, but that's not really how God works. How God works is really to bring hope and healing into very difficult situations. And then the third thing that I want to point out that makes this story is unique and bizarre is this story takes place after God gives the people the Ten Commandments. God has given Moses the Ten Commandments. He's brought them down from the, from the mountain. And, and they have these commandments. And the very first commandment is, hey, don't love anything more than you love God. And the corollary to that is not to make a graven image. Not to, to, to make an, a, a golden calf, right? Or a bronze snake. Don't make something that is then going to be lifted up and venerated and worshipped. You worship only God. And so it's very bizarre then that God tells them to make a graven image. And put it on a pole and lift it up. And the people look at that and live that's bizarre. We don't see God ever doing that ever again in the Bible. And so it's a real head scratcher. A very unique story. But let's keep going. Number four, when we think of snakes in the Bible, what do we think of? Right? We think of the evil one. We think of the Garden of Eden. We think of the, the, of, of the devil possessing a snake and using it to tempt Adam and Eve. And we think of the serpent as being something really, really bad. We don't think of the serpent as being healing. We don't think of a serpent as being good, especially in the Bible. Number five, we see a change we see a lot of changes going on in the story. First of all, we see a change in the minds of the people. The manna that was once delicious is now miserable. They've changed their minds. And God changes something. He changes something bad, snakes, into something good, healing. The bad thing even becomes the basis for the healing Right? Remember that. And then number six, the rejection of God's grace brings death. Right? They reject the manna, which is keeping them alive. And because of that, God sends snakes, which kill. The bad thing, death, becomes the basis for the good thing, healing. So we see all kinds of interplay between bad things and good things and the bad things becoming the basis for the good things. See, all of this foreshadows Christ. The manna, the snake on a pole, all foreshadows Christ. And when we see how it foreshadows Christ and we see the link to this story, from the story, to Christ, all of a sudden everything starts to fall into place. So let's go back to that super famous verse, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And, and this is in the middle of Jesus' teaching. So let's look at the context of Jesus saying this verse. We're going to look at the verse right before this. Anybody know what the verse right before this is? Yeah, it's John 3, 15. Right? <laughs> And, and here it is. That's my favorite joke. Um, it's the connective tissue that connects this story from Numbers to Jesus and John 3.16. John 3.15. 
just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Wow. Wait a minute. That whole story from Numbers, as obscure as it is, as unique as it is, as bizarre as it is, happened, I think, as one giant setup for Jesus to teach about his crucifixion. Let's go through those same six points again. Number one, forgiveness is central to the story in a unique way. Forgiveness has been around before Jesus came along and before, the, before he died on the cross. But the, Jesus, the story of Jesus dying on the cross brought forgiveness to us in a unique way, in a very special way, in really the only way. Forgiveness becomes absolutely central to the story of Jesus' crucifixion. I want you to notice also, God doesn't take away the snakes. God doesn't take away the sin. God doesn't take away the, I mean, we're, we still live in a broken world. We still sin. Even those of us who are believers and the Holy Spirit lives in us and we can see the Holy Spirit working in us to, to make us better people, but we don't see us becoming sinless. And we don't see the broken world being fixed yet. It will happen. What we see today is we see the hope and the healing from Jesus' crucifixion, powerful in our lives. God doesn't take away the snakes. He provides hope and healing through Christ on the cross. Number three, this, this bizarre graven image thing of the serpent is really just foreshadowing the people God told Moses look lift it up put it on its staff which is foreshadows the cross and people would look up at it as we would look up at Jesus on the cross as Jesus says in 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 in, in the in the John 3 15 right anyone who looks upon me will be saved we see all that foreshadowing going on. Number four, when we think of snakes in the Bible, we think of the evil one. We, when we think of crucifixion, when we think of death, that we don't think of that's a good thing, right? But God takes a bad thing and he uses it as the basis for something good. He takes the worst thing, the death of his son, and he turns it into the best thing, which is the death of his son for the forgiveness and salvation of the world. Number five, all this change, the change of the mind of the people and the change of, of, of God changing something from, that is bad into something good, we see all of that coming out in Christ on the cross. And number six, the rejection of God's grace brings death. That's the whole thing, right? Anyone who would reject Jesus on the cross, crucified, for the, for the forgiveness of our sins. Anyone who rejects the idea that the only way to truly be saved, to truly be healed, is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Reject that and die. Believe it and be saved. And therefore, death is the bad thing that becomes the basis for the good thing. We too, as his believers, must die before we rise. I must have no glory. All glory must be reserved for Christ. Therefore, it's very important for God wants us to understand that there, we, we cannot imagine or pretend that there's anything good in me that is the basis for my salvation. That there, there's nothing that's in me that is the, the, the reason that results in my salvation. Even a tiny little bit. No, only faith in Christ saves me. But even that faith does not get its source in me. 
Even that faith that saves me has its source in the Holy Spirit who comes to me and creates faith in me and in you and grows that faith and sustains that faith until everlasting life. That faith does not have its source in me because if it did, if I, if I were to start patting myself on the back saying, good job, Mark, you believe in Jesus and because you believe in Jesus, now you're gonna be saved. That is like me taking a little bit of credit for my salvation, which takes credit away from Christ, which takes glory away from Christ and the Father will not have that. All glory must be given to Christ. He is the one who is to be lifted up on the cross. It is his glory. That's why we keep saying that the cross is his glory because he is lifted up on the cross. He is, his glory, his, his being lifted up is the cross. And so therefore I reserve no glory for myself, no credit for myself. His salvation, his Unconditional love and acceptance of me is sourced completely in Christ on the cross. And that is a good thing, right? It is a good thing. It is good for, it is what's best for us. And it is also for his glory. 